Branch 4. The use of our spiritual armor put on the whole of God. He fourth and last branch in the saints' furniture is, the use they are to make thereof one put on the whole armor of God. Briefly, what is this duty put on? These being saints, many of them at least, whom he writes to, it is not only putting on by conversation, what some of them might not yet have, but also, he means they should exercise what they have. It is one thing to have armor in the house, and another thing to have it buckled on, to have grace in the principle, and grace in the act. So that the instruction will be, our armor or grace must be kept in exercise. Doc Dean. It is not enough to have grace, but this grace must be kept in exercise. The Christian's armor is made to be worn, no laying down, or putting off our armor, till we have done our warfare, and finished our course. Our armor and our garment of flesh go off together, then, indeed, will be no need of watch and ward, shield, or helmet. Those military duties and field graces as I may call faith, hope, and the rest shall be honorably discharged. In heaven we shall appear, not in armor, but in robes of glory. But here these are to be worn night and day, we must walk, work, and sleep in them, or else we are not true soldiers of Christ. This Paul profs saith to endeavor. Herein do I exercise myself, to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men, and here we have this holy man at his arms, training and exercising himself in his postures, like some soldier by himself handling his pike, and inuring himself before the battle. Now the reason of this is, first, Christ commands us to have our armor on, our grace in exercise. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning, Lou. 1235. Christ speaks either in a martial phrase, as to soldiers, or in a domestic, as to servants. If as to soldiers, then let your loins be girded and your lights burning, that is, we should be ready for a march, having our armor on for the belt goes over all and our match lighted, ready to give fire at the first alarm of temptation. If as to servants, which seems more natural, then he bids us, as our master that is gone abroad, not through sloth or sleep to put off our clothes, and put out our lights, but to stand ready to open when he shall come, though at midnight. It is not fit the master should stand at the door knocking, and the servant within sleeping. Indeed there is no duty the Christian hath in charge, but implies this daily exercise, pray he must but how, without ceasing, rejoice but when, evermore, give thanks for what, in everything, the shield of faith, and helmet of hope, we must hold them to the end, L.P. I-13. The sum of all which is, that we should walk in the constant exercise of these duties and graces. Where the soldier is placed, there he stands, and must neither stir nor sleep till he be brought off. When Christ comes, that soul shall only have his blessing whom he finds so doing. Second. Satan's advantage is great when grace is not in exercise. When the devil found Christ so ready to receive his charge, and repel his temptation, he soon had enough. It is said he departed for a season, Lu.4.I3, as if in his shameful retreat he had comforted himself with hopes of surprising Christ unawares, at another season more advantageous to his design, and we find him coming again, in the most likely time indeed to have attained his end, had his enemy been man, and not God. Now if this bold fiend did thus watch and observe Christ from time to time, doth it not behove thee to look about thee, lest he take thy grace at one time or other napping? What he misseth now by thy watchfulness, he may gain anon by thy negligence. Indeed he hopes thou wilt be tired out with continual duty. Surely, saith Satan, when he sees the Christian up and fervent in duty, this will not hold long. When he finds him tender of conscience, and scrupulous of occasion to sin, he saith this is but for a while, ere long I shall have him unbend his bow, and unbuckle his armor, and then have at him. Satan knows what orders thou keepest in thy house five closet, and though he hath not a key to thy heart, yet he can stand in the next room to it, and lightly hear what is whispered there. He hunts the Christian by the scent of his own feet, and if once ho doth but smell which way thy heart inclines, he knows how to take the hint, if but one door be unbolted, one work unmanned, one grace off its carriage, here is advantage enough. Third. Because it is so aki a business, and hard a work, to recover the activity of grace once lost, and to revive a duty in disuse. I have put off my coat, saith the spouse, CAV 3. 
she had given way to a lazy distemper, was laid upon her bed of sloth, and how hard is it to raise her? Her beloved is at the door, beseeching her by all the names of love which might bring to her remembrance the near relation between them, he crieth, My sister, my love, my dove, open to me, and yet she riseth not, he tells her his locks are filled with the drops of the night, yet she stirs not. What is the matter? Her coat was off, and she is loath to put it on she had given way to her sloth, and now she knows not how to shake it off, she could have been glad to have her beloved's company, if himself would have opened the door, and he desired as much hers, if she would rise to let him in, and upon these terms they part. The longer a soul hath neglected duty, the more ado there is to get it taken up, partly, through shame, the soul having played the truant, now knows not how to look God in the face, and partly, from the difficulty of the work, being double to what another finds that walks in the exercise of his grace. Here is all out of order. It requires more time and pains for him to tune his instrument, than for another meaning of being odd or out of order. To play the lesson. He goes to duty as to a new work, as a scholar that hath not looked on his book some while, his lesson is almost out of his head, whereas another that was even now but conning it over, hath it too at his finger ends. Perhaps it is an affliction thou art called to bear, and thy patience is unexercised. Little or no thoughts thou hast had for such a time while thou wert frisking in a full pasture and now thou kickest and flingest, even as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke, j.e. Uxai. Is whereas another goes meekly and patiently under the like cross, because he had been stirring up his patience, and fitting the yoke to his neck. You know what a confusion there is in a town at some sudden alarm in the dead of the night, the enemy at the gates, and they asleep within. Zero what a cry is there heard. One wants his clothes, another his sword, a third knows not what to do for powder. Thus in a fright they run up and down, which would not be if the enemy did find them upon their guard, orderly waiting for his approach. Such a hubbub there is in a soul that keeps not his armor on, this piece and that will be to seek when he should use it forth. We must keep grace and exercise in respect of others our fellow soldiers. Paul had this in his eye when he was exercising himself to keep a good conscience, that he might not be a scandal to others. The cowardice of one may make others run. The ignorance of one soldier that hath not skill to handle his arms, may do mischief to his fellow soldiers about him. Some have shot their friends for their enemies. The unwise walking of one professor makes many others fare the worse. But say thou dost not fall so far as to become a scandal, yet thou canst not be so helpful to thy fellow brethren as thou shouldst. God commanded the Eeobenites and Gadites to go before their brethren ready armed, until the land was conquered. Thus, Christian, thou art to be helpful to thy fellow brethren, who have not, it may be, that settlement of peace in their spirit as thyself, not that measure of grace or comfort. Thou art to help such weak ones, and go before them, as it were, armed for their defense, now if thy grace be not exercised, thou art so far unserviceable to thy weak brother. Perhaps thou art a master, or a parent, who hast a family under thy wing. They fare as thou thrivest, if thy heart be in a holy frame, they fare the better in the duties thou performest, if thy heart be dead and down, they are losers by the hand so that as the nurse eats the more for the babe's sake she suckles, so shoot'st thou for their sake who are under thy tuition, be more careful to exercise thy own grace, and cherish it. Objection. Zero but, may some say, this is hard work indeed, our armor never off, our grace always in exercise. Did God ever mean religion should be such a toilsome business as this would make it? Answer first. Thou speakest like one of the foolish world, and showest thyself a mere stranger to the Christian's life that speakest thus. A burden to exercise grace. Why, it is no burden to exercise the acts of nature, to eat, to drink, to walk, all are delightful to us in bright temper. But if any of these be otherwise, nature is oppressed, as, if stuffed, then it is difficult to breathe, if sick, then the meat is offensive we eat. So take a saint in his right temper, and it is his joy to be employed in the exercise of his grace in this or that duty, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord, P-A-X-E. I his heart leaped at the motion when any occasion diverts him from communion with God, though he likes it never so well, yet it is unwelcome and mipleasing to him. As for you, who are used to be in your shops from morning to night, how tedious is it to be abroad some days, 
though among good friends, because you are not where your work and calling lies. A Christian in duty is one in his calling as it were in his shop, where he should be, yet, where he would be, and therefore far from being tedious. Religion is so burdensome to none, as to those who are infrequent in the exercise of it. Use makes heavy things light. We hardly feel the weight of our clothes, because fitted to us, and worn daily by us, whereas the same weight on our shoulder would trouble us. Thus the grievousness of religious duties to carnal ones, is taken away in the saints, partly by the fitness of them to the saints' principles, as also by their daily exercise in them. The disciples, when newly entered into the ways of Christ, could not pray much or fast long, the bottles were new, and that wine too strong, but by the time they had walked a few years, they grew mighty in both. Dost thou complain that the heaven way is rugged? Be the oftener walking in it, and that will make it smooth. Answer second. Were this constant exercise of grace more troublesome to the flesh, which is the only complainer, the sweet advantage that accrues by this to the Christian, will abundantly recompense all his labor and pains. One the exercise of thy grace will increase thy grace. The hand of the diligent make rich. A provident man even counts that lost which might have been got, not only when his money is stole out of his chest, but when it lies there unimproved. Such a commodity, saith the tradesman, if I had bought with that money in my bags, would have brought me in so much gain, which is now lost. So the Christian may say, my dawning knowledge, had I followed on to know the Lord, might have spread to broad day. I have more understanding, saith David, than all my teachers. How came he by it? He will tell you in the next words for thy testimonies are my meditation, Virginia 6. 99 He was more in the exercise of duty and grace. The best wits are not always the greatest scholars, because their study is not suitable to their parts, neither always proves he the richest man that sets up with the greatest stock. A little grace well husbanded by daily exercise will increase, when greater grace neglected shall decay. 2 As exercise increaseth, so it evidenceth grace. Would a man know whether he be lame or no, let him rise, he will be sooner satisfied by one turn in a room, than by a long dispute, and he sitting still. Wouldst thou know whether thou lovest God? Be frequent in exhorting acts of love, the more the fire is blown up, the sooner it is seen, and so of all other graces. Sometimes the soul is questioning whether it hath any patience, any faith, till God comes and puts him into an afflicted estate where he must either exercise this grace or perish. Then it the soul appears like one that thinks he cannot swim, yet being thrown into the river, then uniting all his strength, he makes a shift to swim to land, and sees what he can do. How oft have we heard Christians say, I thought I could never have endured such a pain, trusted God in such a strait. But now God hath taught me what he can do for me, what he hath wrought in me. And this thou mightst have known before if thou wouldst have oftener stirred up and exercised thy grace. 3. Exercise of grace doth invite God to communicate himself to such a soul. God sets the Christian at work, and then meets him in it. Up and be doing, and the Lord be with you. He sets a soul a reading as the eunuch, and then joins to his chariot a praying, and then comes the messenger from heaven. 0. Daniel, greatly beloved. The spouse, who lost her beloved on her bed, finds him as she comes from the sermon. It was but a little that I passed from them but I found him whom my soul loveth, ca 3. For use and application. Use first. This falls heavy on their heads, who are so far from exercising grace, that they walk in the exercise of their lusts. Their hearts are like a glass house, the fire is never out, the shop windows never shut, they are always at work, hammering some wicked project or other upon the anvil of their hearts. There are some who give full scope to their lusts, what their wretched hearts will, they shall have, they cocker their lusts as some their children, and deny them nothing, as it is recorded of David to Adonijah, they do not so much as say to their souls, why doest thou so? Why art thou so proud, so covetous, so profane? They spend their days in making provision for these guests, as at some inns, the house never cools, but as one guest goes out another comes in as one lust is served another is calling for attendance, as some exercise grace more than others, so there are greater traitors in sin, that set more at work than others, and return more wrath in a day, others in a month. Happy are such, in comparison of these, 
who are chained up by God's restraint upon their outward men or inward, that they cannot drive on so furiously as those who, by health of body, power, and greatness in place, riches and treasures in their coffers, numbness and dedolency one in their consciences, are hurried on to fill up the measure of their sins. We read of the Assyrian, that he enlarged his heart as hell, stretching out his desires as men do their bags that are thracked asterisk full with money to hold more, Hab A5. Thus the adulterer, as if his body were not quick enough to execute the commands of his lust, stirs it up by sending forth his amorous glances, which come home laden with adultery, blows up this fire with unchanged ast sonnets and belly cheer, proper fuel for the devil's kitchen, and the malicious man, who that he may lose no time from his lust, is a-tearing his neighbor in pieces as he lies on his light, and cannot sleep unless some such bloody sacrifice be offered to his ravening lust. Oh how may this shame the saints! How oft is your zeal so hot that you cannot sleep till your hearts have been in heaven, as you are on your beds, and there pacified with the sight of your dear Savior, and some embraces of love from him? Use second. It reproves those who flout and mock at the saints, while exercising their graces. None jeered as the saint in his calling. Men may work in dot their shops, and every one follows his calling as diligently as they please, and no wonder made of this by those that pass by in the streets, but let the Christian be seen at work for God, in the exercise of any duty or grace, and he is hooted at, despised, yet, hated. Few so bad indeed, but seem to like religion in the notion, they can commend a sermon of holiness like a discourse of God or Christ in the pulpit but when these are really set before their eyes, as they sparkle in a saint's conversation, they are very contemptible and hateful to them. This living and walking holiness bites, and though they like the preacher's art in painting forth the same in his discourse, yet now they run from them, and spit at them. This exercise of grace offends the profane heart, and stirs up the enmity that lies within, as Michael, she could not but flout David to see him dancing before the ark. He that commended the preacher for making a learned discourse of zeal, will rail on a saint expressing an act of zeal in his place and calling, now grace comes too near him. A naughty heart must stand at some distance from holiness, that the beams thereof may not be too strongly on his conscience, and so he likes it. Thus the Pharisees the prophets of old, these were holy men in their account, and they can lavish out their money on their tombs, in honor of them, but Christ, who was more worth than all of them, he is scorned and hated. What is the mystery of this? The reason was, these prophets are off the stage, and Christ on. Passiter in rids liver, post fata quixit envy feeds on the living, but after death it ceases. Use third. Try by this whether you have grace or no. Dost thou walk in the exercise of thy grace? He that hath clothes, surely will wear them, and not be seen naked. Men talk of their faith, repentance, love to God. These are precious graces, but why do they not let us see these walking abroad in their daily conversation? Surely if such guests were thine in thy soul, they would look out sometimes at the window, and be seen abroad in this duty and that holy action. Grace is of a stirring nature, and not such a dead thing, like an image, which you may lock up in a chest, and none shall know what god you worship. No, grace will show seven itself, it will walk with you into all places and companies, it will buy with you and sell for you, it will have a hand in all your enterprises, it will comfort you when you are sincere and faithful for God, and it will complain and chide you when you are otherwise. Go to, stop its mouth, and heaven shall hear its voice, it will groan, mourn, and strive, even as a living man when you would smother him. I will as soon believe the man to be alive, that lies peaceably as he is nailed up in his coffin, without strife, or bustle, as that thou hast grace and never exercise it in any act of spiritual life. What? Man, hast thou grace, and carried as peaceably as a fool to the stocks, by thy lust? Why hangest thou there nailed to thy lust? If thou hast grace, come down and we will believe it, but if thou beest such a tame slave as to sit still under the command of lust, thou deceivest thyself. Hast thou grace, and show none of it in the condition thou art placed in? Maybe J thou art rich. Dost thou show thy humility towards those that are beneath thee? Dost thou show a heavenly mind, breathing after heaven more than earth? It may be thy heart is puffed with thy estate, that thou lookest on the poor as creatures of some lower species than thyself, and disdainest them, and as for heaven thou thinkest not of it. 
Like that wicked prince that said, he would lose his part in paradise rather than in Paris. Art thou poor? Why dost thou not exercise grace in that condition? Art thou contented, diligent? Maybe instead of contentation thou repinest, canst not see a fair lace on the rich brother's cloth, but grudgest it, instead of concurring with providence by diligence to supply thy wants, thou art ready to break through the hedge into thy neighbor's fat pasture, thus serving thy own turn by a sin, rather than waiting for God's blessing on thy honest diligence. If so, be not angry we call thee by the right name, or at least question whether we may style thee Christian, whose carriage is so cross to that sacred name which is too holy to be written on a rotten post. Use forth. Be exhorted, zero yes saints of God, to walk in the exercise of grace. It is the minister's duty, with the continual breath of exhortation, and if need be, reproof, to keep this heavenly fire clean on the saint's altar. Peter saw it necessary to have the bellows always in his hands, I will dot not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. 2 p. I 12. That shall not take him off, as long as he is in this tabernacle, he saith he will stir them up, and be putting them in remembrance, ver. 13 There is a sleepy j disease we are subject to in this life, Christ though he had roused up his disciples twice, yet takes them napping the third time. Either exercise thy grace, or Satan will act thy corruption, as one bucket goes down the other riseth, there is a body of sin within which likely a malignant party watcheth for such a time to step into the saddle, and it is easier to keep them down than to pull them down. Thy time is short, and thy way long, thou hadst best put on, lest thou meanest to be overtaken with the night before thou gettest within sight or thy father's house. How uncomfortable it is for a traveler in heaven's road, above all other, to go potching in the dark, many can with aching hearts tell thee. And what hast thou here to mind like this? Are they worldly cares and pleasures? Is it wisdom to lay out so much cost on thy tenement, which thou art leaving, and forget what thou must carry with thee? Before the fruit of these be ripe which thou art now planting, thyself may be rotting in the grave, time is short, saith the Apostle, 1c 0.7.29. The world is near its port, and therefore God hath contracted the sails of man's life, but a while, and there will not be a point to choose whether we had wives or not riches or not, but there will be a vast difference between those that had grace and those that had not, yet, between those that did drive a quick trade in the exercise thereof, and those that were more remiss. The one shall have an abundant entrance into glory, 2 p. I.2, while the other shall suffer loss in much of his lading, which shall be cast overboard, as merchandise that will bear no price in that heavenly country. Yet, while thou art hero others shall fare the better by thy lively graces. Thy cheerfulness and activity in thy heavenly course will help others that travel with thee, he is dull indeed that will not put on, when he sees so much metal for God in thee who leadest the way, will give a check to the sins of others, who never stand in such awe, as when grace comes forth and sits like a ruler in the gate, to be seen of all that pass by. The swearer knows not that such majesty is present, when the Christian is mealy-mouthed, and so goes zero eleven and fears no colors, whose grace, had it but her dagger of zeal ready, and courage to draw it forth in a wise reproof, would make sin quit the place, and with shame run into its hole, the young men saw me and hid themselves, the princes refrained talking, and laid their hand on their mouth, Job. XXIX8, 9. And doth not God deserve the best service thou canst do him in thy generation? Did he give thee grace to lay it up in a dead stock, and none to be the better? Or can you say that he is wanting to you in his love and mercy? Are they not ever in exercise for your good? Is the eye of providence ever shut? No, he slumbers not that keeps thee. Is it one moment off thee? No, the eye of the Lord is upon the righteous, he hath fixed it forever, and with infinite delight pleaseth himself in the object. When was his ear shut, or his hand, either from receiving thy cries, or supplying thy wants? Nay. Doth not thy condition take up the thoughts of God? And are they any other than thoughts of peace which he entertains? A few drops of this oil will keech, the wheel in motion.